Well, how do you do? This is Mike, your film reviewer for home video DVDs and Blu-rays. And I recently got, an, I ordered a movie. And it's a movie that I've seen before, but it's remastered by Classic Flicks. I think it's Classic Flicks. Yeah. And uh, it's a movie that, that I find, that I wanted in 1985. And I finally got it. Uh, well, I actually got it when they shut. When I got a questionable VHS print, a third generation copy, and then finally, I saw uh, a, a Turner Classic Movies uh, showed a beautiful print of it. And uh, and. Um, I laid it through my old secondary VH, third, third generation VH copy away from it. Now I happen to be a fan of uh, early Technicolor films, part to full length. Uh, early two color to three strip Technicolor. And for years I've been waiting for Time Warner to pay the copyrights and put out classics like Under a Texas Moon and re-underlining the rights for being these nights, but uh, they haven't done it yet. And for years, glorifying the American Girl with its uh, part, top, part color sequences was public domain, but uh, lesser brands were unwilling to get the original uncut version. Obviously, UCLA might have been charging as much as a, uh, what do you call it, a, a full-length color feature. Finally, Kino Lober put it out, finally. I'm also still waiting on Pointed Heels, the restored version with the, um, um, with the uh, Marie Antoinette sequence, in the dance sequence that had Fay Ray in it, which probably inspired Michael Curtis to hire her for Mystery of the Wax Museum to portray the Marie Antoinette image. And it was until 1985 that um, I decided that uh, that I spotted something in, in a video magazine, the VHS version of the Bogues of 1938. Night was made in 1937, but the problem was this is 1985. They wanted a whopping eighty dollars for it for the VHS. And boy, that frustrated me because I originally got King of Jazz for $29.95 before it restored VHS. And uh, I thought this would be the same thing, but they were overcharging. For years, I had to do it out. But get, and I'll say it again, Classic Flicks had deci has decided to remaster it and reissue it. So we're about to open it up. Now, before we open it up, I want to say that in last um, show, I told you that Roman was almost ready. I found out that they got this month to finish, but from what I learned, it's going to be released sometimes in June, even for the Kickstarter backers. I kind of felt disappointed. It's been a year and a half, but I guess, I guess it takes patience since restoring classic films can take years anyway. So let's open it up. Here it is. The Bogues of 1938, the first professional DVD version of it, and hopefully they'll hopefully that they have really remastered it because, uh, well, the print they showed on TCM wasn't that bad. But let's hope it's a, it's a little bit done better because I haven't watched it yet, but I'm going to. And uh, here's a picture of Joan Bennett and uh, Warren. Uh, Warren Baxter and Hedda Hopper as the father, and the actress who played uh, would play the Blondie series. I forgot her name, but uh, 
she was in her auburn hair and she dyed it to play the Blondie series in the 40s. And uh, here's the back side. And here's the sides. And uh, I'll read it. Um, for the first time in home video comes an engaging technicolor musical comedy with romance set against the background of Fifth Avenue fashion. Debutante Wendy Van Clittering, Joan Bennett, is being forced into a loveless marriage uh, to a wealthy Henry Morgan, played by the actor who played in Becky Sharp, Alan Mulberry, for the purpose of restoring the family's sagging financial outlook. But on a big day, she jilts Morgan and escapes the media mob with little help from fashion designer George Curzon, Warner Baxter. Owners of the prestigious style house of Curzon, George has designed on his own on Wendy and hires her to model, gambling that her runaway bride and notoriety will give his staff as much needed publicity boost. Romance soon starts with the blossoms between George and Wendy, particularly once George's wife, Mary Helen Benson, um, neglects him because she set her sights on her stage career. And uh, there's plenty of music and screwball fun in the production of Walter Wanger's Vogues of 1938, a frothy, tuneful concussion that was nominated for two Academy Awards Best Cinema Photographer, Art, Best Art Direction, Alexander Tulupu, Tuluboff, and Best Original Song, Sammy Fain, and uh, Sammy Fain, Lou, uh, Sammy Fain, Lou Brown Standard, That Old Feeling. Directed by Urban Cummings from a screenplay by Bella and Samuel S S Spiewak, Spiewak, Spiewak. Wanger assembles top-notch for the Vogue's include Misha R., Jerome Cowan, Alma Kruger, Mar Marjorie Gates, and Hedda Hopper, Penny Singleton, yeah, and later known to millions as Blondie, still being billed as Dorothy McNuff, Dorothy Mac N McNulty. And another interesting thing about this movie is that it introduced a special kind of makeup that actresses could wear comfortably in front of the camera. It was called pancake makeup. When movies like Becky Sharp started, and even the shorts that were experimenting in 33, 33, 34, women had, actresses had to wear grease paint, even the men. Well, they introduced pancake which thereby had a sheen, puts a sheen on one's face. Even the actors had male actors that wear that. And the light, and it would be a little bit dark and the light's thrown off and it looks natural, but it looked better that the, that the uh, chorus girls that played a small scene in, uh, in, in the middle of the picture actually stole the cosmetic when they discovered they could wear it normally. But, Max Factor had to improve it because it made your face, made a woman's face dark, so I had to improve, improve it to make, make a woman's complexion lighter. But it was a lot more comfortable than wearing grease paint. So uh, let's open it up more. Now we open it up, and here's the thing. And what I'm going to do is to watch a picture, watch the movie, and give you my overview of it. Well, I'm back from us uh, uh, seeing the movie. And you know what I found out about the Vogues of 38? Walter Wanger wanted to produce it in 1934 as the first all-talking, all-singing, all-dancing feature in three-strip Technicolor. And they were assigning Frances Langford to being part, part uh, in the movie, whether she was a singer who would sing that old feeling if it was written back, back then. 
But Walter Wanger decided to wait till the three strip Technicolor was improved a little bit better. But imagine if he decided to go ahead and do it. Becky Sharp probably would not have been done. And maybe the Dancing Pirate would not have been done. And maybe Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers films of the 30s, maybe, but maybe Follow the Fleet would have been shot in three strip Technicolor. Remember, back then things were, the Depression was still going and was very, very expensive. And uh, up until 37, later on, uh, they had, they considered Francis Langford, they had her assigned in there. And then Carol Lombard was considered to playing um, uh, Wendy Van Clittering. But she was afraid that Technicolor would make her look good. She was afraid of that. Well, anyway, it turned out that the print is the same print that they put out in 1983 that they show on AMC. It's it's a good print, but they didn't. It looks like they could have used the same videotape master and digitalized it a bit rather than taking the original surviving film element from the British archive. Yes, in the British archives now, and digitalize it. I guess it. I guess it probably would have been too expensive because I'm in Serial Midnight. I remember uh, watching uh, an interview with Kino Lober, uh, head director, head, and he stated how it's very expensive to produce movies in 4K. So I guess it was, this would have been way too expensive to get the original elements and actually digitalize it. If the master was still good, well, it was still, you know, well, is why? pay extra expense it was still a good print it was still a good print and uh, as I said the movie won for best direction best art direction and for that old feeling sang, uh, sang by Virginia Verrill and then there was Fred Lawrence who in 1936 was in the three strip Technicolor Warner Brothers show at Echoes let's see I got someone forget um, uh, Echoes of the Mountain, and uh, he sang a uh, lovely one, and Ladies of the Evening. And then there was that group in the nightclub, uh, let's see now, I don't want to forget, uh, Dottie Salter and uh, Maurice Rocco and his band with the Four Hot Shots. And they sang, and they had sang, sang, and they had sang that turn on that, and they had sang that turn on that heat, sing the blues away. And this had proceeded with the king of jam music by the four hot shots, the female dancers, and Dorothy Stalter at the Cotton Club or a portrayal of it. This would be Helen Vincent who played Mrs. Curzon's uh, first and only appearance in Technicolor. I suppose if it was shot in 34, they would have hired to play Mrs. Curzon. But anyway, um, um, it's a pretty good entertaining picture and it's better than The Dancing Pirate. This was the second musical in three strip Technicolor to be shot and it was better than the dancing part because it had big stars and it had um i don't know whether joan bennett's hair was naturally blonde and she dyed it black later or she was black and she dyed it naturally was blonde but um she was pretty good as the uh woman who didn't want to get married to henry morgan played by alan mulberry and and um, and certainly, um, uh, what's his face? Um, Misha R, who played P Prince Moritov, was very good in his his uh, caricaturization of a failed designer. And how? Um, Jerome Cowan is begging um, 
uh, Warner Baxter put money in show. See, he married his char character for three years. She gave up showbiz. She wants to go back. She's bored to death. But she's, uh, as um, Alma Kruger stated, plays the president of Curzon, said she has no talent. And she plays a very concerned woman, wants to make sure her, 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 her styles go through, but she has a heart condition. Now, this was before the heart valve transportation, and she was, the character is slowly dying. And uh, another song they have is Lovely One, which is sung by Verrill and Lawrence, and then the Weir Brothers who show up. Weir Brothers were basically equivalent to the Ritz Brothers. But actually, they lasted a little bit longer because they showed up in 1960 on an episode of the Dinosaur Chevy Show, so they were still popular by 1960. And uh, the way it's shot, it looks like they were having problems with the heaviness of the Technicolor camera because they had to use that protection booth to cut the sound off and then added weight. And it looks like they had some difficulty in the camera shots because of the heaviness of the, of the soundproof uh, box and the heaviness of the camera. And that's what it looks like. And... Uh, It was good that Classic Flicks decided to put it on DVD. It's worth a buy and it's worth a rental if, you, if it's online. And it comes from the surviving positive print that was released in Britain. So what else do I have to... Well, anyway, um, oh yeah, it also included the Olympic trio demonstrating um, this, the, the show that uh, was being put on by Jerome Cowan, have Helen Vincent back in show business, uh, skating uh, skating techniques. I think they showed up. In, no, I could have been wrong. I think could have been another. I think they showed up in the uh, uh, Ice Follies of 1939. Could have been the same group. And. Uh, As I said, it was pretty good of an entertaining film, and it's pro it's better than The Dancing Pirate, even though that's collectible. It's better than The Dancing Pirate. Oh, yeah, and another thing I just forgot. Uh, the man who danced to the music, a jazzy, a jazzy version of that old feeling after Virginia Barrow sang was George Taps. So, if you like this review of the Bogues of 1938, please like, comment, and subscribe. I'll talk to you later. Bye.